Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I am again running from death. Today, I would like to speak about the larger objective in the fight against death. By this, I mean that we should not just be opposed to one particular kind of death, whether it be death by senescence or death from a particular illness or series of illnesses. Rather, we should be opposed to death of innocent human beings from whatever source it may come. Now is a particularly relevant and pressing time to hold this discussion because of all of the natural disasters that have been occurring recently, particularly earthquakes. The Sendai earthquake in Japan, which began a week ago, has been particularly devastating. Over 10,000 people are estimated to have been killed. Entire towns have been leveled to the ground. The earthquake was followed by a massive tsunami. A nuclear plant suffered a meltdown and explosions and there will probably be radiation damage, at least to the workers who are struggling to put out this calamitous meltdown. At the same time, the earthquake in Japan was not the first of its kind in very recent memory. There was a devastating earthquake in Haiti in the beginning of 2010, and while the earthquake itself was not of a very strong magnitude, because of extremely poor infrastructure in Haiti, it inflicted tremendous damage, tens of thousands of deaths, massive loss of infrastructure, much of which has still not been repaired. In February of 2010, there was a much stronger earthquake in Chile with several hundred deaths. That country had better infrastructure, and thus the earthquake did not take such a heavy toll, even though it was many times more powerful. There were two earthquakes in New Zealand, one in late 2010, and another one just last month in February. The second one was more devastating than the first, both hit the city of Christchurch. And some scientists are beginning to think that the occurrence of earthquakes is not altogether independent of one another. It is impossible at this point, using what seismologists already know, to predict when and where an earthquake will happen, though it has been thought possible to reasonably estimate the severity of one. However, even that has been called into question by the sheer magnitude of the Sendai earthquake in Japan, a 9 on the Richter scale, which was outside the bounds of what pretty much any commercially used catastrophe model estimated to be possible along that fault line in Japan. And this is rather startling because it highlights in a very brutal fashion how little we actually know about these natural disasters that every now and then punctuate our lives in a dreadful manner. Some scientists are beginning to think that there is some dependency among earthquakes, especially earthquakes that affect a particular fault line. And the occurrence of an earthquake, for instance, in one place along the Pacific Rim might actually increase the probability of another one. I'm not a seismologist, I can't comment on the validity of this theory, but if it is true, it's something definitely to look into. The larger point, though, is that we are still in an era of almost complete barbarism as far as anticipating and preventing disasters is concerned. It is really sad how much misery human beings are willing to put up with, even when times are good, when nothing is considered to be outside of the normal range of events. Tens of thousands of people in the most developed countries of the West perish in vehicle accidents every year. There are many ghastly and gruesome accidents and injuries that occur. There are failures every now and then of the energy infrastructure that all of us depend on. Think back to the gas line explosion that destroyed a neighborhood near San Francisco last year, or the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, where the negligence of BP resulted in the loss of livelihood of thousands of people along the Gulf Coast, and injuries and deaths to hundreds of people. And of course, the nuclear plant meltdown in Japan illustrates the lack of preparedness of that nuclear plant to withstand an earthquake of that magnitude, even though the specifications to which it was constructed were designed to withstand an earthquake of around a magnitude 7.5. None of this is meant to disparage a particular source of energy. I'm not opposed to the use of oil. I'm not opposed to the use of nuclear power. I'm not opposed to the use of natural gas. I do support safety precautions being taken to ensure that energy, which is supposed to be our friend and our servant, does not become our downfall. But the way in which I support this is through a realignment 
realignment of human priorities, a recalibration of what we consider to be pressing and important in terms of how we address the world and how we address our everyday lives. For most people, unfortunately, the approach to involuntary death, death through senescence, death through major diseases, death through accidents, big or small, death through catastrophes, is seen as almost an imposition of fate, something outside the human being's ability to control, something that is essentially a roll of the die. On most days, most people will not come across it. The people who do come across it are unfortunate, but they're not most people. So the rest just keep plodding along. And most people tend to want to see some improvement in their lives. On a day-to-day -day basis, they'll do the small things that they consider to be within their power to achieve a slight marginal betterment here or there. But when it comes to addressing the larger threats, most people do not prepare on a personal level and they do not consider themselves capable of changing things for the better on a global level. A sizable chunk of people try to rationalize what is happening as inevitable and sometimes even desirable. They can't prevent it, so they might as well accept it and try to enjoy whatever little bit of their lives they can lead in peace. I reject that attitude of submission and fatalism because that attitude leaves human beings helpless. Now, I do not think that perfection in responding to disasters or preventing them is feasible in the near term, within the next several decades at the very least. So this is not a criticism of human beings for failing to prevent every bad thing that could possibly happen. However, this is a criticism of those who leave these kinds of perils outside the realm of their everyday awareness altogether, and those who somehow think that a life punctuated by small-scale accidents and deaths all the time, and enormous deaths every once in a while, is acceptable, or normal, or desirable, or part of the natural order. It may be natural, but it's no order that I want to subscribe to. Also, I intend this discussion to be a call to action, for human beings to start thinking seriously about how to avert these kinds of disasters, and if they do happen, how to minimize the damage that comes from them. This is an objective that dovetails quite nicely with the goal of indefinite human life extension. The longer human beings live, the more such disasters will be on their personal level of awareness. Assuming that earthquakes behave the way they do, independently of human beings for now, since we don't have the ability to prevent them or diffuse them before they happen, the longer a person lives, the more likely a person is to endure an earthquake or any other natural disaster whose frequency is thus far outside of human control. And that means that a person who lives longer has a much more direct and personal stake in ensuring that such disasters don't happen, or if they do happen, to minimize their consequences. I don't pretend to know how to prevent an earthquake, or even how to predict one. If I knew, I would be doing it right now. And there are certainly other disasters, cataclysmic ones, that need to be targeted by future technologies and hopefully by human beings who are personally invested in the success of this disaster fighting effort. Hurricanes, tornadoes, extremes of weather, meteors that could potentially wipe out the entire human species and all other higher order life forms on this planet. All of these are threats that at one stage or another of its existence, the human species will have to contend with. And unless we want to go the way of 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed on this planet, which have become extinct, there needs to be some serious thinking put into how to combat these disasters. And at present, our society is woefully inadequate to that task. We do not have institutions that adequately encourage innovation and creative thinking and independent initiative. Human institutions are highly bureaucratized and constrained, preventing creative individuals from applying even those discoveries that they manage to arrive at just by tinkering. There's no systematic encouragement toward the use of reason, nor is there the allowance of liberty to exercise it. There is a distinct ideological current throughout the world, and it is growing in the West, that advocates command and control, the restriction of those few freedoms that human beings have historically been able to wrestle away from the forces of command and control by means of advancing technology. 
Open source network collaboration among individuals through the internet shows great promise as a way of innovating technologically. And this form of collaboration is going beyond software. It's spreading into such fields as biotechnology. Perhaps this is a great way to develop solutions to the greatest problems facing us, from natural disasters to senescence to disease to poor political and societal institutions. But there are efforts underway right now to quash internet freedoms, whether it be in the name of intellectual property or in the name of national security or in the name of plain old hunger for power and the desire to keep the populace stupid and uninformed so that they could be subservient, as is routinely done by dictators in the Middle East. In many cases, human beings can be their own worst enemies if they develop and succumb to suboptimal institutions that discourage creativity, discourage independence and freedom, and thereby discourage progress. I can't stress enough that the imperative to have freer institutions is not just one of relatively more comfort versus relatively less comfort. It's not just one of, do you spend one minute waiting in line at the grocery store or do you spend five hours? It's a question of life versus death. And it's not just a question of whether the people who are in charge of these institutions kill or maim you or imprison you. It's also a question of what is foregone when you have a restrictive society and a restrictive political system. What inventions are not made? What solutions are not developed? What ideas do not evolve? Because people have to worry about fulfilling much more basic day-to-day -day needs as that is all that the resource base allows. Along with technological advancement, societal advancement is vitally necessary in order for human beings to solve these pressing problems that have in total taken billions of lives throughout the very short history of our species. Indeed, if we do not attend to these problems, the history of our species may be short and over pretty soon. I do not consider it utopian to think that we might at one time live in an environment where we actually do have control over what happens around us, where we have knowledge of our bodies and how to prevent them from deteriorating and being destroyed that we have knowledge of the terrain that we inhabit and the weather that we face on an everyday basis and the infrastructure that we use and the people with whom we interact and the social and political order that informs our interactions with one another. To say that we can get this kind of knowledge, which is really quite basic knowledge, one were to think about what it is that we need to ensure a stable, peaceful, comfortable, prosperous existence, that would be it. To say that we can get this knowledge is, I would say, the mere baseline of what should be possible. It's to affirm, essentially, that we are not all doomed. And if you're the kind of person who likes to think that we are all doomed, then I would pause and think again, irrespective of whether a particular endeavor to diffuse or diminish or altogether eliminate some of these perils is successful, wouldn't it be better to try? Because if one doesn't try, one is left with the status quo. And the status quo is a beast that will get you if you do not evolve beyond it. Thank you very much, and I hope that one day we will live in such a world where these calamities will not befall us without even a shred of warning.